Okay. And Okay, I uh, hope everyone had a great long weekend and uh, uh, are nice and refreshed and uh, ready to do maybe the final push. I guess we have one more uh, day off. There's a wellness day in uh, a few weeks and stuff, so that should be all accounted for in the schedule. And um, uh, so this week we're going to cover source coding and uh, then also a little bit about uh, kind of some practical uh, aspects of developing uh, communication systems in a, in a wireless wireless way and that's really calculating noise figures and uh, the impact of noise on your your system and and more of a, a physical way circuits way systems way type of thing and also a little bit about spur free dynamic range right so um, on the, the one hand we have noise that limits us um, you know when our, our signal is very small and then we also run into problems with nonlinearities which leads to spurious signals uh, when our signals are very strong. And so uh, that ends up defining our dynamic range of our receiver. So we'll talk a little bit about that on Friday, but today we'll discuss uh, source coding. But first, I uh, finally developed the um, MATLAB exercise. I think this is uh, seven, assignment seven. Eh, I'm not sure, uh, something along those lines. and. Uh, this one's going to explore uh, linear block coding using the Hamming code uh, and also convolutional coding. And so um, I have a, a few references here. Uh, there might be some other functions that you need to look up. I, uh, you know, we're, we're getting into a more complex system now. We're including more of those blocks of that. Uh, overall communication model. You remember that thing? It looks kind of like a backward C uh, or whatever that has a transmitter channel and then, then the receiver, right? So now we're including this um, channel encoder and the channel decoder, right? And uh, so here uh, we're going to set up and we'll just use uh, binary phase shift keen. So that's a, a PSK with an M equals two. Right, and uh, it's uh, equivalent to uh, binary antipodal signaling. Basically, you've got uh, your mapping to a, a plus one or a minus one, uh, that type of thing. So, um, and so we'll start with that. We'll generate a hundred thousand random bits, and uh, uh, use a BPSK modulator and an AWGN uh, channel. And um, let me clean up my screen here locally a little bit. And um, uh, use this ADVN channel, set the SNR to 6 dB, and uh, estimate the number of errors and calculate the bit error rate of the system. Then uh, use a uh, Hamming uh, linear block code, and you can just use Hamgen 3 as the uh, a function called create a parity check matrix, generator matrix, and then the values of K and N. And then uh, I ask you, so uh, you know, pay attention to these things in old face. I want you to give me a, a explicit answer to these things, right? Um, and so what is the code rate of this code, right? So you're just gonna divide K by N and uh, come up with that. Then uh, create a table of syndromes, and you can use this uh, send table, uh, and you pass it in the parity check matrix, and it will automatically create that list of uh, syndromes with the error vectors, right? And so when we receive our uh, code words, we then run them through this, uh, you know, multiply the code words by the parity check matrix. And then that should give you 
uh, these syndromes. And uh, then if the syndrome zero, fine, no, we're, we're done, right? But if it's not zero, it means we have an error and we take that uh, syndrome and we look up the error vector that corresponds to producing that syndrome. Then we can uh, use an XOR uh, function to um, uh, correct the code word based upon that uh, error vector. Then we can, um, uh, since the Hamming code is a systematic code, the message bits actually show up in that uh, code word, right? Now, uh, a few things that we need to take uh, a look at here is that you can just like generate uh, uh, like K message bits at a time and process them. But uh, MATLAB is a matrix language, so you can generate a whole bunch of bits, right? In my case, I'm generating 100,000 bits to begin with. And then you are going to shape your matrix using uh, reshape here uh, to uh, put it into uh, column uh, k k columns, and uh, then n divided by k rows in the matrix. Right. So that's like uh, since k here is uh, is going to turn out to be four, then you're going to have um, uh, 25,000 rows, right? Uh, 100,000 divided by four, right? So it's just reshaping a vector into a uh, matrix. And then we're going to, uh, you know, en encode it. And, you know, I mentioned Galois fields and, uh, you know, we didn't really go deep into it. It gets uh, very, you uh, um, powerful but it's a little bit complex right so we're we're just kind of mentioning that these exist but uh when you're doing this you're going to need to use a modulo 2 or you know some of the uh code that you might see uh, example code might use this remainder uh uh function it should give you the same results i think and uh so you're just wanting to use modulo 2 type uh results here then uh, again, you're going to modulate, demodulate uh, while you're adding some ADVN uh, noise, and uh, then doing the uh, uh, syndromes, looking up syndromes, uh, doing the uh, XOR operation, and then extracting out. Now, uh, back to that extracting out. It's a systematic code, but MATLAB orders things in a little bit different way. Uh, than what we did in class. And uh, both are totally legitimate solutions. In class, in those examples, uh, in the lecture and the PowerPoints, uh, the systematic part of the code comes first, and then the parity bits come afterwards. And that's kind of the more intuitive way, I think, because uh, it's similar to like uh, uh, checksums and that type of thing we see in uh, communication uh, systems and other places. But in MATLAB, at least the defaults that I used in my example, the uh, parity bits come first and then the systematic part comes later. So um, uh, then you, uh, once you, corrected all these uh, code words. Now you uh, can extract it and then you can either use reshape again to flatten that matrix back to a vector or you can just use this colon operator and uh, that's a little bit easier. And uh, then you're gonna compare it again. Uh, then uh, uh, calculate the bit error rate uh, number of, uh, error bits and, and bit error rate, right? And then once you compare the Hamming code results to the uncoded result, then we're gonna do a uh, uh, convolutional code and again, compare it. And uh, here we're going to uh, represent the uh, generator polynomials with uh, uh, 
kind of a, a binary code, right? So you can look at this and uh, here we have a generator polynomial of X squared plus X, right? And if you remember, you know, it was a, a week ago, I guess, but we have uh, these uh, state machines and uh, a uh, uh, some memory that might be implemented using flip-flops and a shift register. And then we're, peeling off parts of those, um, uh, you know, memory locations and then summing them up at the output again using modulo two uh, addition. But, uh, you know, we represent those memory locations with these uh, generator polynomials. And uh, we can look at like this one, X squared plus X plus, well, plus zero. And that would be, uh, uh, represented as a number as one, one, zero, right? And uh, so that's a six. And then also uh, this would be, uh, the second generator polynomial would be a one, 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 because each uh, term is, is represented there. So one, 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 of course that's a seven, right? So that uh, we're uh, taking these polynomials and uh, converting it to a trellis, right? And so uh, there's uh, a constraint length of three, right? Because we've got these uh, three different powers of um, the polynomials represented. And so, uh, you know, very, very similar to what we looked at in class. And so uh, this will generate a trellis and then you pass that trellis in when you actually do this uh, convolutional encoding of the uh, the bits, right? And then you can do the modulation, add some AWGN and some uh, then demodulate it, and then uh, use a Viterbi decoder. Now uh, here we're going to put in the receive code, the trellis, the same trellis that you calculated up here. And then there's this traceback depth. You remember last week I talked about how uh, sometimes you deal with like infinitely long uh, or nearly infinitely long sequences. Here we're we're dealing with the sequence that's 100,000 bits long, right? So we don't necessarily want to uh, wait until we've processed all 100,000 bits through that or actually this is a code rate of one half, so it's going to be 200,000 bits uh, in the code word, uh, in code. Uh, it's not really parsed into words anymore, but um, 200,000 bits before we start, you know, tracing back that trellis, uh, that's going to require too much memory and take too much time, right? So uh, we use a traceback depth of 34, which is just what, MATLAB uses in some of their examples uh, when they're, you'll you'll see that when you look up a bit of a Turby decoder and stuff. So, um, and so what it'll do is it'll process out to 34 and then uh, do that trace back in the Viterbi decoder and then kind of, you know, truncate that uh, first state and, and just kind of keep a running uh, total of these uh, 34 uh, steps and all. So, uh, and we'll truncate there and uh, we'll use hard decision coding. So uh, we, we mentioned that there was hard and soft. Soft tends to be better, uh, but you know, that's uh, uh, kind of beyond the scope of this course. Uh, and so then calculate the number of errors and then compare it all, right? And then since this is random, you're generating these bits randomly and the noise is, is a random process run it a few times and just see how it works, right? And um, uh, so let's look at uh, this and I've got an example code here. So uh, shouldn't take that long to run, right? So again, this is a, a feature of using a matrix approach to this. If you did this in a for loop, in MATLAB at least, it would be a lot slower. But MATLAB is designed, you know, at the very under level guts of it to do matrix 
operations and so it's uh it's very quick so here um uh let's walk through the code i uh initialize things by you know uh setting everything to zero i set up with a hundred thousand points of a, a capital land there and i'm setting m equals two this makes it a binary phase shift keying uh mre equals uh two or bpsk i'm setting yes and r to 6 db uh the awn uh, uh function takes that snr in terms of db and then i create these random uh bits from zero to one and uh i create uh n of them right and then I just do it without any error correction. And uh, so that's, uh, we've done this before. We just PSK mod, uh, we pass it through the AWM channel and specify measured. You could do like uh, um, average unit energy equals true up here or something like that. Um, but uh, this, this should give you uh, reasonable results and then print that out. And we see that out of 100,000 bits, we're getting 246 errors, right? And that's an error rate of 0 0.0025 or so. Not too bad. BPSK has uh, a, a very big distance, right? And uh, so it's not very bandwidth efficient. Uh, we're not doing like a 64 qualm or 128 qualm or something like that, right? So we expect pretty good performance, but we're still getting some errors, right? And then um, I'm going to generate the uh, uh, hamming, uh, and that gives you back results in this order. Go look this function up, and uh, that's a parameter that specifies that code. There's a whole a uh, bit about primitive polynomials and that has to do with this Galois fields and and that type of thing. And if you uh, go and study error control coding as a you know complete course, then you're going to dive into all these uh, different things and look at how primitive polynomials are uh, created and defined and that type of thing. But we're just gonna pass in three there right, this is magic number three, and it's gonna create us an H uh, Purdy check matrix, a generator matrix, and then it will return back the N and K associated with this code, right? And then we can right away create this um, syndrome lookup table and uh, pass it as uh, H, that should give you uh, something that looks like uh, this, right? And uh, so, here we have as a first entry, we have the old zero syndrome, so there's no errors. And then uh, for each of the syndromes, uh, so these would be ordered in numerical order. So this would be a syndrome of zero, a syndrome of one, two, three, four, five, and, and up to seven, right? And so uh, this is then a lookup table and uh, each row will give you back the error vector. And uh, so, but uh, now we're going to reshape our input bits to have uh, end of cap n divided by k rows uh, by k uh, columns, right? And then we're going to calculate our code words by taking these input blocks and multiplying it by the generator matrix, right? So if we look at G here, uh, G here is this uh, generator matrix, and we see in this first part, um, these are our parity bits uh, that, that create the, the matrix that part uh, that creates our parity bits. And then here, this portion here, I wish I could select just this part, this part here is the identity matrix, so that's the systematic part, right? That's where you're going to find your message bits at the end, right? And so um, we we just multiply. Of course, this is doing a mo matrix multiplication. Uh, we don't have to code that up. MATLAB does that automatically for us, right? And uh, then we're doing this remainder or modulo two math. Then uh, that produces our code words, now just a larger set of bits, 
right? And uh, we're going to modulate those the same, add some uh, noise, demodulate them, and now we have our received code words. These are likely to have some errors in them. So now we're going to multiply that by our parity check matrix and by convention, uh, that parity check uh, it comes back as H, but we're really multiplying it by H prime. You'll actually get an error if you forget that H prime because the sizes of the matrices won't match up right to be able to do a valid matrix multiplication, right? And so uh, just do a transpose error again, we're using this remainder two, and that gives you your syndromes. Now, uh, these syndromes are now in, in, uh, in this case, three bit vectors. We're going to convert those to a decimal number, right? And we can use this uh, binary to decimal uh, conversion where we're assuming our left most column in that matrix represents the most significant bit and so on, right? And uh, then we're going to, uh, uh, well, here what I do is I, I just compare now these, um, uh, I, I look at how many syndromes have uh, non-zero values to them, right? And that, that's telling us how many errors we had uh, to begin with, right? We could compare these uh, received code words with the transmitted code words, right? So this um, is kind of showing you that, well, since this is a rate one, uh, well, it's um, uh, it's a rate three, uh, three uh, seven code, right? And so we're transmitting a lot more bits than necessary, right? We're transmitting these redundant bits, and uh, that means that well, we're likely to have more errors, right? Uh, but our bit error rate should be about the same because we haven't done anything with these things yet. Right, and so that's what I'm calculating here. And then um, we take those decimal values of the uh, syndromes and use those in a lookup table. And note that I uh, provide this note in the uh, exercise write-up that MATLAB uses one space indexing. So where uh, this might be a zero value which would uh, mean there's no error, right? Uh, let's add one to that because again, MATLAB uses arrays that start at one instead of at zero like most other languages do, right? So, um, so that's what this one plus is for. And um, this column, uh, this comma colon means uh, uh, extract the row, but give me, the whole uh, you know row of values, right? Uh, so all the columns in that row. And so that gives me back a uh, set of error vectors. Now it's, again, it's going to be a matrix. So there's going to be 25 of these, 25,000 of these, right? 25,000 rows. You can look over here and see error vectors, 25,000 by seven, right? So our error vectors are seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven long, right? Now we're gonna correct those and we're gonna do a bitwise X or, uh, or you could do a modulo to addition, it's the same thing, right? And uh, uh, with our received code words and our error vectors, right? So we, we have these received code words up here, we calculate the syndromes. Now we figured out what error vectors are associated. And uh, if there's no error, we're just gonna get this zero, all zeros uh, error vector. So that XOR with itself is just gonna give uh, the original uh, value. Uh, so RX, you know, if um, this RX uh, code words is, is XOR with an all zeros vector, it's just still gonna produce the same value. So we can do all that in one step. We don't have to do any filtering to, only operate on the ones that have errors, right? And so now we have the corrected code words and we're just going to extract out the Rx blocks from that, right? 
and then uh, now we can compare them and uh, to the input bits. And here's that colon operator that's essentially reshaping it back into a vector, right? So Rx blocks here is going to be still a 25,000 by four, because uh, that's our K size, right? And so now we're, uh, we're doing that again. And uh, then we have our results, right? And then I'm gonna go through this um, also convolutional coding. So we're plugging in uh, these values and um, uh, creating a, a uh, this trellis, encoding it, modulating it, and then uh, un uh, unencoding it, right? So uh, that's the whole process. Again, if I run this a couple of times, you're gonna see some different values here in uh, uh, the uh, convolutional coding uh, is doing better in this case, right? So we're getting zero, maybe we need to add more instead of doing 100,000 points, maybe we need to do uh, a million points. You see once that bit error rate gets down to close to that one over capital N, we need to um, we need to use larger Ns to get an accurate uh, counting of this, right? So here we've got uh, uh, seven versus four. Note that the uncoded version here is 239. Uh, the number of errors with the extra bits in the block coding, at least, is 409. But that's about the same bit error rate, right? Uh, you know, and this is where we're just looking at those received code words and we haven't applied any error correction to it yet, right? So, so that's the assignment. Uh, yeah, so uh, I know you can go back and look at this lecture and kind of copy it. Um, you know, but obviously you want to, uh, you know, uh, you put the steps down yourself and run through it. And make sure you understand what's going on there. All right, so uh, let's put all that aside and get into the uh, lecture for today. And uh, here I'm gonna talk about the source coding, but first we'll start with information theory. And we've talked about that a little bit uh, at the very beginning of the course and another time uh, kind of in the middle. Now we're going to kind of peel off some more onions of this information theory uh, a little bit because it's important for the source coding concepts, right? And um, then we'll look at uh, two different algorithms that have uh, uh, very universal appeal, but kind of approach things in two different ways. So uh, first, let's do some motivation for source coding, right? So not every uh, thing is equal probable, right? So that's one of those assumptions that we kind of make. Remember with our receiver technology, we said maybe we can use this um, uh, uh, maximal likelihood receiver when the symbols are equal probable, um, uh, but uh, they're not always equal probable, right? And our bits, our information that our uh, source is providing isn't always equal probable. Uh, now, before we get into this, what is a source, right? So a, a source right now, uh, and this, application where I'm uh, doing this Google Meet thing here is that you're seeing, you're hearing my voice. So the analog voice is going into the uh, microphone, a sound pressure that comes out as, um, uh, initially comes out as an analog voltage signal, but then that gets sampled and quantized, right? So sampled in time, make it discrete, and then uh, quantized to make it digital. Uh, so we can represent it as a binary value. That is source encoding, right? We've taken these, anal uh, these uh, analog continuous sound pressure waves that comes from my vocal cords uh, to ultimately a digital and discrete representation of that, right? 
And so uh, all the things you learned about sampling uh, things in uh, probably second semester last year in signals and systems when you started looking at the digital things, then um, all, all that applies. You may have touched on that in your embedded uh, computing work uh, when you looked at A to D converters, D to A converters, right? So um, uh, let's consider the alphabet, uh, the letters of the US English alphabet, right? So uh, yeah, nowadays we develop software for international markets and we use uh, you know, something like Unicode or something like that. But in the old school days, uh, we used 8-bit uh, ASCII to represent uh, the English language, right? Uh, the English alphabet. And so here we have a bunch of different letters, right? So there's the uh, 26 letters lower and then 26 upper and the 10 digits of numbers, but then also a bunch of um uh, special characters and concepts and that type of thing, right? So there's uh, eight bits. This forms an alphabet, right? Uh, that's, uh, yeah, we we think of an alphabet we learned in kindergarten or first grade, right? A through Z. But, um, you know, more generically, an alphabet is the set of symbols that we have in our source, right? So, um but yeah, uh, I think we've all probably watched uh, at least one episode of Wheel of Fortune, and we know that the 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 art of winning that game is to to have some knowledge of what letters appear most often in the English language, right? And so, uh, not all of these characters are equal probable. So, uh, enter the Morse code, right? So Samuel Morse is generally credited with inventing the telegraph. The epiphanous Morse code is one of the earliest examples of digital source and uh, coding. It uses the shortest sequences of dots and dashes for the most common letters. For example, E here we know is very common and it's represented by a single dit, uh, uh, dot, right? And uh, then T is represented by a single uh, dash. And of course, T is also a very common letter. Sometimes we call these dits and dots, uh, or dots and dashes, right? And each one takes a certain amount of time to uh, to send. And uh, so we see that more complex or, or rarer numbers are uh, tend to have longer codes associated with them, uh, but very common letters have uh, short codes. So um, I is uh, two, two dots, uh, two dits, and uh, S is three, and so on, right? So uh, yeah, fun fact, Morse is buried in Greenwood Cemetery down in Brooklyn, right? Or is that Queens? Uh, and you can uh, make your own pilgrimage there. That's that's me in front of his, uh, his tombstone. That's quite a tombstone, isn't it? Uh, but he was pretty influential in communication systems. So, um, all right. So by making the most common letters shortest in time, he minimized the time to send a message composed of a typical set or sequence of the English language letters. Can we do the same? Or can we improve? on this right so uh by reducing the number of bits needed to send some information we can get a head start on the capacity bound remember this is shannon's capacity theorem right so we're always trying to maximize our capacity given these constraints of how much bandwidth we can use and how much signal power we can can use right and so um if we can compress our uh, source information very efficiently, then uh, we don't need to send as many bits to begin with. And so we're getting a head start on that capacity. All right, so um, let's look at this a little bit more formally uh, before we just kind of stated that uh, equation and we stated uh, I, I gave you an equation for entropy. We're still not going to go that deep, but I want to give you a little bit more background here. Recall that the amount of information in a source is related to its probability. 
P of X, hang on a second, I want to check something here. Um, okay, um, where am I? Okay, so um, if the probability of X is equal to one, then we know what is being uh what it is right we know absolutely that it that it is uh uh x is uh takes on a particular value of that uh alphabet right and so there's no need to transmit or if uh the probability of x is equal to zero then we know it can't be that and so uh again there's no need to transmit so if we have this alphabet of X1 out to X, let's say capital L, then uh, that's a set of different things that we want to be able to represent and communicate, right? Each letter in the alphabet, um, did I spell that right? Has a given probability of occur occurrence, right? And we'll, We'll call this uh, the probability of the random variable capital X taking on a particular value X of, of K here, where, where K can range from one to L, right? And um, so, and we'll we'll designate that as shortcut as P sub K, right? And that's that K is ranging from one to, to L uh, values, right? And you know, if we sum all those probabilities up, uh, then we know from some of our axioms of probability theory that that uh, total probability should be one, right? We got to send one of the ones in the alphabet, or or we haven't, you know, specified our complete alphabet or something, right? So, uh, if a source is discrete uh, and each output is statistically independent of the others then we're going to call that a discrete memoryless source, DMS. Again, this is one of those assumptions that doesn't always apply, but when it does apply, we can have a lot of simplifications, right? So uh, always be aware of the simplifications uh, and assumptions that you make in uh, engineering. So uh, now we're going to consider two discrete random variables, X, capital X, and capital Y, with uh, possible outcomes in the alphabets uh, with, that we'll describe with the script X and script Y. Again, an alphabet looks something like this, right? It's a total set of all the values that that random variable can take on, right? And uh, so what is the amount of information that the outcome where uh, the random variable cap Y takes on a particular value Y what is the amount of information that that outcome provides about the event X, where the random variable X takes on a particular value uh, uh, of X, right? So that's a conditional probability, right? We're, we're saying that given that Y is equal to little y, uh, what's the probability of X equals a particular value of X, right? So, um, uh, so we, write that as a shorthand, and then uh, note that uh, the probability of X is uh, defined as, as this, right? So um, so now, and this is just a review of what we learned when we reviewed our probability theory, right? So I'm not, not introducing anything new there. So, um, so define the mutual information between X and Y as, okay, so now these are lowercase, right? So these are particular values, right? And uh, that the random variable can take on. Uh, so we're gonna say that this, this is capital I, which is describing this mutual information. We're gonna put a semicolon in between there, right? Where uh, this is now this log of the conditional probability divided by the probability of X, right? So what this is doing is it's telling us how much does our knowledge of Y really uh, affect the information here? And, you know, this is a log. Well, uh, we don't tend to use log base 10, but sometimes we use log base E and log base two. And again, here's that conversion between the two. 
uh, where uh, ln is a natural log, right? So, um, and now uh, we can look at the mutual information between the random variables capital X and Y as the average of the information of these particular values, right? Again, these random variables X could take on any of the values in the alphabet, right? Uh, just kind of reviewing the notation here. So here we'll write this I of uh, in cap X and Y, and this is just the average, right? So we're uh, taking the uh, information uh, of uh, each of uh, the specific values over the values in the alphabet, right? And then weighting that by these uh, this joint probability, right? And that gives us that average. And uh, so we can substitute in this uh, uh, thing we wrote here uh, to designate that. And uh, you know, now we have it in terms of this log thing here. And okay, some, um, uh, you know, we'll call them fun facts to know uh, that I'm gonna uh, not prove, but uh, kind of write down. Uh, so uh, this information, mutual information of uh, X uh, semicolon Y is the same as uh, information of Y semicolon X. And um, the mutual information is always greater than or equal to zero, where um, uh, it's equal to zero if and only if X and Y are statistically independent, right? And so you can start to uh, uh, think about that. You can kind of plug these in if um, uh, knowledge of, uh, if they're statistically independent, then Y has no impact. Knowledge of Y has no impact on the probability of uh, X. And so this ends up being uh, PX over PX, that's one, log of one is zero. So we can see uh, how that can come about there, right? And also uh, maybe a little bit uh, harder to uh, just kind of uh, fuddle your way through, but the uh, mutual information is uh, going to be less than or equal to the minimum of the sizes of these alphabets here. Uh, so, um, all right, so now, uh, when knowledge of Y, uh, the random variable Y taking on a particular value uniquely determines the occurrence of the event uh, X, then this uh, probability uh, of uh, X given Y is equal to one, right? So, you know, if we know that and that uniquely determines, oops, uh, X, then, um, then that conditional probability is one, right? So uh, just by definition of uh, what that conditional probability means. So um, now we can put in one at the numerator, and now we have this uh, relationship of a log of one over the probability of x equals x. And uh, we can rewrite this using a property of logarithms uh, and uh, just have a, a minus sign there, right? So we'd have a log of one minus a log of uh, this uh, denominator, but that log of one is zero, so we have zero minus this, right? So this is uh, kind of the result we're looking for. And then um, again, we can, uh, this is the uh, lowercase values, right? So then now we can look at the average. And uh, so we can plug this in, the, we don't, really need to average over Y since we're saying that that's uniquely determining it, right? So um, so this is where we end up with this minus this uh, average over this uh, uh, log of the probability of this, right? It's a weighted, uh, uh, weighted summation of these, right? So that's giving us that mean. And that is what we're calling an entropy. Uh, H of X, right? So we talked about entropy at the very beginning of the course and did it very hand wavy. Well, there's still some hand waviness going on here. I skipped a few steps, but hopefully now uh, you're seeing that, yes, there is some uh, fundamental rationale to coming up with this 
a thing we call entropy, right? And so the entropy is going to range from zero uh, to the log of the size of the alphabet, right? And uh, again, that can be dimensioned. Uh, this log can be in a uh, natural logarithm, and we'll call this nats as a unit, or it can be in um, um, uh, base two, and we'll call it bits, and, and so on, right? So, uh, so here uh, we're going to end up with uh, some of these relationships. I don't think we'll use these, so I'm just going to kind of skip over those and, and get on with the lecture here. Um, so we can try to finish this. Uh, so now a little bit more about information theory. We talked about this discrete memoryless source or each sample from the source is statistically independent of others. And it's of course a source and it's of course discrete, right? So, um, in, in fine. Uh, now Shannon's first theorem Right, so the Shannon guy, he got around, right? So uh, he did the capacity theorem, but there's this uh, lossless source coding theorem, right? So let uh, capital X denote a discrete memoryless source with entropy uh, X, right? And um, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I guess maybe that could be H of X there too. Uh, there exists a lossless source code so we're we're now developing a source code for the source at any rate r if r is greater than this entropy of x right there exists no lossless code for the source at rates less than this entropy of x so this gives us some uh set of bounds on things right so um on how much we can compress the source before we start to see loss of information. And if um, we have a uh, rate higher than this value here uh, in uh, let's say bits per second, right? Then we are uh, able to create a lossless code. If uh, we try to compress it, uh, uh, more than that, then we're going to end up in a lossy type situation, right? So um, now, how can we compress the source in order to ultimately maximize the capacity but still be lossless, right? So that's, you know, okay, given that this, this theorem here is setting up these bounds, right? So now uh, how can we do that? Well, we're going to look at two different ways. And uh, the Huffman code is an example of a variable length coding, and the uh, Lempfell ziv is an example of fixed length coding. And they have their, their trade offs, right? So uh, let's first look at lossless uh, coding algorithm with variable length source coding, right? So here we're going to have an alphabet. Uh, and just for simplicity, we're going to have four different. Uh, values in that alphabet, right? So it could be a traditional English language alphabet, A, B, C, D, and we just truncated it at four, right? So um, now we're gonna say that uh, the probabilities of any of these things are known and they're, they're different, right? And this uh, uh, A sub one is likely to happen half the time, right? One half. And uh, A2 is one quarter, A3 and A4 are both one eighth. Uh, so that uh, probability, if we've uh, listed all the uh, members of the alphabet, then that probability should sum to one, right? Now, there's three different codes uh, listed here. And this is actually out of uh, the Proicus book, which is, I think uh, listed as a, a reference on this, but if you find this online, uh, you will um, uh, be able to look in chapter six uh, of this or go to the library. I think the library had one copy uh, when I was teaching this years ago. So, um, but here we have three different uh, codes and they're variable length, right? So in uh, sending A1, well, it happens more often than these others. So. Uh, if we're using variable length coding, we ought to set it with the shortest code, right? And that way, 
uh, since we're sending A1 most of the time, we're sending it with the shortest version of the code, right? But um, note that there's some problems with this code in that um, it doesn't satisfy what we call the prefix condition. So if we start receiving values and let's say we receive a one, well, that might be A1 or it might just be the start of A4 and we got to see what comes after it, right? Or uh, if we receive a zero, then we're not quite sure if that's the start of A2 or the start of A3 and we've got to wait and uh, decode that, right? So um, this prefix condition requires that for a given code word CK of length uh, K, right? Then having elements, blah, blah, blah. There is no other code word of length L less than K with elements B1, B2, dot, 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 uh, to B L where, okay, uh, L is greater than one, uh, but uh, greater than or equal to one or but less than or equal to K minus one, right? So it basically means that these uh, do not appear as a prefix of another code word, right? So no whole code word of maybe the shorter versions appears as a prefix of another code word, right? So, um, and then we, uh, so there, there's kind of two things we want when we're creating a code. We want it to be uniquely decodable, right? So there's uh, no ambiguity between codes. And uh, we desire that there be instantaneously decodable, right? So if, as soon as we uh, see a match uh, to a code word as we're receiving uh, these bits, then we know exactly which one it applies to, right? And uh, so we can look at this. Uh, code one is, is not really uniquely decodable, right? So, uh, for example, a uh, 1001, uh, let's see, I should maybe write that on here. Um, a uh, one zero zero one could be interpreted as a four followed by a three, right? But it could also be a one followed by a two followed by a one, right? So it's not uh, uniquely decodable. It, it could be either one of those, right? And then if we look at uh, code three here, it's actually uniquely decodable, but it's not what we would call instantaneous, right? So um, we would have to kind of keep accumulating values. We get a zero. Well, we don't know if that's A1 or the beginning A2 or the beginning A3, right? So we have to wait. But uh, look at this code two. If we get a zero, there's no other code that starts with zero. So we know right away it's A1. Boom. Instantaneously, we're done. If we get a one zero, then we know that it's A2, right? So instantaneously, once we've satisfied that code, you know, for a particular letter in the alphabet, we don't need to wait around anymore, right? And um, same way with this one one zero. There's no other uh, things that, that exist as a prefix. See, here this zero shows up as a prefix there. This zero one shows up as a prefix there along with this zero being a prefix there, right? So uh, this is uh, not this uh, prefix code. So, um, all right, so that's, uh, you know, we saw that, that code two here is it's kind of a nice code. Uh, how do we kind of create that systematically, right? So, um, uh, oops, wrong direction. So uh, are these good codes? How do we measure that? Well, one way of doing it is looking at the average rate. So if we get a whole sequence of a bunch of A1s, A2s, A3s, A4s all mixed up, uh, but following this probability overall, 
then uh, what's our average rate to be able to send those, right? So we would look at the probability of each of those, right? When when we're averaging things, we're, we're technically weighting by the probability of the individual members, right? Where NK now is number of bits per source letter, right? So A1 has one bit, A2 has two, A3 and A4 all have three bits, right? And so we would calculate that and we can calculate this average rate. And that's a great metric to be able to compare these codes, right? So um, here's yet another theorem uh, that I'm not going to prove, but um, source coding theorem for prefix codes. So let X be a, a discrete memoryless source with finite entropy H of X and output letters AI. Uh, where uh, uh, that I range, ranges from one to cap N with corresponding probabilities, it's possible to construct a code that satisfies the prefix condition and has an average uh, length R that satisfies this relationship here, right? So again, this entropy is coming into play. We calculate uh, the entropy and we know that uh, we should be able to create a uh, coding, assuming it's a discrete memoryless source, right? Each uh, each value is uh, uh, statistically independent from another sample in uh, that series. Then uh, we can come up with this average rate that's between h of x and h of x plus one. All right. So uh, finally, let's get to an example: a Huffman algorithm. Uh, this I'm just going to uh, explain this kind of step by step, and we'll look at a few examples, and uh, so uh, I think we can get through at least the Huffman. So what we do is we're given this uh, alphabet. In this case, we have uh, seven, one through seven, and each uh, of these alphabet uh, values has a probability, right? And again, you should be able to add these up and come up to one, probability of one. Right, and uh, we can take this and calculate the entropy of each of these, or the self-information, the i of uh, x, uh, semicolon x. Uh, so that's just h of x, right? So um, using a log base two version, then. Uh, but what we're doing is we're going to order these in descending order of probabilities, and we're going to create a tree, and we're going to start connecting branches of the tree by connecting ones that have the lowest probability, right? So we look through all these and we see that, well, here's two that have the lowest probability. They happen to be the same, right? But let's connect them. And now let's write down the joint probability, right? So the probability of any either of these happening uh, is the sum of these, right? 0.01. And then we take that and we now look for the next lowest probability, which is 0.04. And we connect those and we add those together. 0.01 plus 0.04 is 0.05 and so on. We connect 0.05 now with the next lowest probability. And it was handy that we ordered these in decreasing probability, right? It makes this search easy. So 0.05 with 0.1, that's 0.15. 0.15 with 0.2, that's 0.35. And now 0.35, well, there's a 0.35 there uh, or 0.3 there. Let's um, let's take these two and uh, let's take this 0.3. So this 0.35 is not the lowest one, right? So this 0.3 is the lowest probability. So we could actually connect it with this 0.35 or the 0.3 with this 0.35, right? And uh, I'll, I'll show you both versions. So in this case, we'll just connect it with this 0.35 and uh, connect those. And now we have 0.65 and the 0.35. So 0.35 is now the remaining lowest probability and we connect it with the next remaining lowest probability. Well, there's, there's only one left, right? And so these now as a check should give you a probability of one. Right. And uh, so there's implied labeling out here. Now we go back and label them. Right. And and we just kind of do this step by step. Uh, we start out here and we'll assign a zero for the top one and we'll assign a zero there on the top and a one on the bottom, a one on the bottom, one on the bottom, 
on the bottom, on the bottom, on the bottom, zeros on the tops, right? And now we write down our code word. So we'll start here and we'll write down a zero, zero to get us to this one, right? So I could have labeled these out here as X1, X2, X3, down to X7, right? That's really what these uh, branches are. So to get to X1, we go to zero, zero, right? So that's our code. To get to X2, we go zero, one, zero, one. To get to X3, here we go uh, one, zero, right? And then to get to um, uh, X4, we do a one, one, zero, and and so on, right? So it's X size, uh, maybe let's let's just jump down to X6, right? So one, 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 zero, one, 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 zero, right? So I think you get the pattern. Now we can calculate uh, this, uh, look at the lengths of these. These are the N sub Ks, the, the length, number of bits in all these times these uh, probabilities, sum all that up, and we get a rate, an average rate, uh, maybe that should be an R bar over there, of uh, 2.21. And uh, we can also calculate the overall entropy, and we note that the rate is uh, a little bit above the uh, entropy level. Remember, this is kind of the lower bound. Then, uh, now, we had that choice, when we got to this 0.35 and we saw that really the lowest probability is 0.3 and we in the previous slide we connected it to the 0.35 up here well we can also connect it to this 0.35 right this is a joint probability and uh we can write that down and then uh, uh that sums to 0.65 and then we connect it with that top one right so uh same probability same beginning of the code uh but it it results in uh, a little bit different code, and you can kind of swap back and forth from these. Here we, our uh, lowest, uh, shortest code is zero, uh, zero or zero, one, one, zero, right? Two digits. And our longest one is one, two, three, four, five, right? And uh, here, our shortest one is zero. Uh, we've got one that's uh, two, two digits long, so this is a length of one, a length of two. And K here is one, two, three, four, five, six, right? But if you average these, again, according to the probabilities, the a priori probabilities, you get 2.21 as an average rate. So uh, so these codes, uh, you know, they're not unique, but uh, in this case, they're producing the same performance, right? So they're, they're achieving the same rate, uh, but the codes are a little bit different. All right, so uh, here's another example, and uh, here the values are different, and you see that this this just creates a little bit more complex uh, graph, and just another uh, example of how things work. So we take uh, here, we still have our AKs, A1, A2, A3, out to, uh, uh, or uh, I guess I label it X here, X1 through X8 in this case, right? And we know all these probabilities, right? And uh, so I'm just using a, a smaller table here. Uh, don't include all uh, columns, but all the information's here. And so now we connect these. 0.02 is the smallest. 0.04 is the next smallest. That's 0.06. And then we look for the next uh, for the smallest ones. 0.06 is the smallest, and 0.09 is the next smallest. That sums to 0.15. Now we look. Uh, this is no longer the smallest one. Actually, 0.1 is. And what's the next uh, largest one or the, uh, 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 the next uh, most smallest uh, value, lowest probability, uh, is 0.12. So uh, we're going to connect 0.1 and 0.12, and that's going to give us this joint probability of 0.22. And now we look at 0 0.22, 0 0.15. Okay. Um, what's uh, the next lowest, actually 0.13 and 0.14 are uh, the next uh, set to connect. And so that sums to 0.27. Now we look through, okay, so 0.15 is now the lowest and 0.22 is uh, the next one. And so let's connect those and sum those up to 0.37 and we look around. Okay, so 0.27 is the lowest, 0.37 
0.36 is a little bit lower probability than 0.37. So we connect those two, uh, sum those up, and we get uh, this probability of 0.63. Uh, 0.63 plus 0.37 is equal to 1. Whew, we did it right. And so uh, then we go back and label things. Now, it's really kind of arbitrary that you put zeros on the top and ones on the bottom. You could put ones on the top and zeros on the bottom, um, but you've got to be consistent, right? So uh, here to get to x1, we have zero, zero. To get to x2, we'd have a zero, uh, uh, um, uh, zero, one, zero. To get to x3, we'd have a 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. To get to x4, we start here, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. To get to x5, 1, um, 0, 1, right? x5, 1, 0, 1. To get to x6 is 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. x7, 1, 1, 1, 0. And x8, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so uh, that's how Hoffman algorithm can get even closer to the limit by encoding blocks of J symbols at a time and letting J be very large. Uh, we won't go into that. Uh, the Huffman coding algorithm is optimal in that it produces code words that satisfy the average the prefix condition we talked about earlier, and the average block length is minimized. Again, this is a weighted average by the probabilities, right? Uh, but we need to know the occurrence probabilities of letters in the alphabet, and that's non-trivial. Uh, we don't always know that. Um, uh, so. Um, estimating the probability of occurrence in individual source output letters can be done by observing long sequences, but then we, we need to wait. We need to gather up all these long sequences and then figure it out, right? Um, but we also need uh, joint probabilities when there's memory, right? Then we talked about discrete memoryless sources. What if they're not memoryless, if there's some memory? Now we need joint probabilities. And that becomes very computationally expensive uh, to, to be able to calculate all those by observing uh, long sequences and stuff, right? So um, now, like large language models, if you've been looking at generative AI and, and the large language models that underlie that, you'll kind of see some parallels here, right? So there's uh, uh, some of that 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 model is actually learning. Uh, but it can be very expensive to do that. So this lengthful ZIV source coding algorithm does not require these source statistics. It's a variable to fixed length algorithm. So uh, here we've got three simple steps and we're gonna start by parsing a sequence into variable length blocks called phrases when it differs from the previous phrase by one letter. Okay, I'm gonna show you an example here in the next slide. Then we store each phrase, so we, we're generating all these, um, uh, uh, we're parsing the sequence and generating all these phrases, and then all these phrases should be unique, and we're gonna store each phrase in a dictionary, a, a lookup type thing, right? And we're gonna form the code word by concatenating the dictionary location of the previous phrase with a new bit. Now, okay. What, is, what does that mean? An example makes this uh, a little clear. And you probably want to run through this a few times until it makes sense. Uh, but we take this big long sequence here, right? So this might be a file stored on a disk and we want to compress it before we send it uh, over a communication system, right? And so we're gonna look at this and we're gonna see, okay, here's a, a one. Well, that's obviously unique because we just started, right? So we write that down as our first phrase. Then we'll look at the next one, zero. We haven't seen zero yet before, so that's unique. So we're gonna write that down. Now we see one. Well, that's already appeared and we're trying to break this into unique phrases. So we write down one zero, that has not occurred yet. We write that down. And then we look at this one, one, okay, that's unique. Zero one, that's unique. Zero, zero, we haven't seen that yet. Let's write that down. Now we're here, one, zero. Well, we've already seen that over here. So we grab another bit, one, zero, zero. We haven't seen that before, so we write that down. So we're parsing these into phrases. 
one 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 we've already seen before one one we've already seen before but we haven't seen one 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 so we write that down and uh zero we've seen zero one we've seen zero one zero we had it right and then uh we're here now so we we've seen one we've seen one zero we've seen one zero zero but we haven't seen one zero 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 we write that down and then uh let's see where are we at we're right here we've seen zero we've seen zero one well we haven't seen zero one one right so we write that down note that hey there's three digits for all these and then there's four digits but now we're back to three digits right so it's it doesn't always just get longer and longer right so now uh you continue doing that and uh it's nice when you end uh with a unique value and stuff so uh, this last one, one zero one one, is a unique value. Uh, all right, I still got five minutes. I can do it. Uh, this algorithm. Uh, okay, let's uh, come back to that. So now we plug all these phrases into a dictionary, right? So now we're going to order this dictionary. It's an ordered dictionary, but we're going to start with locations of zero 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 one. Uh, location zero 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 is kind of implied. Right. And uh, so we're going to start there. And we're just going to increment this numerically. Right. So it's just a binary representation of an increasing number one to, well, well we'll need uh, 16 memory locations uh, ultimately, uh, as we'll see. Right. So, um, and then we start plugging in all these phrases in as dictionary contents. Right. So we plug in the first one there, one zero one zero one one and and so on right until we're down to this one zero 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 one and finally one zero one 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 zero one one right so we've included all these phrases now you know your this algorithm becomes efficient when you deal with very very long sequences right so this might be a you know uh, a gigabyte file right so you're going to have a bunch of uh locations um and uh, now we're going to form up our code word. And this is where we, uh, let's see, what do we do? We form the code word by concatenating the dictionary location of the previous phrase with the new bit, right? So now we, we kind of have to think, all right, um, what is uh, uh, the, the previous uh location uh well we'll use zero 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 right and uh then we'll concatenate that bit that makes it unique and here uh, again we'll kind of start with that default memory location of zero 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 and then concatenate that uh uh value there right that made it unique now here's where it starts to get interesting right so uh what was it uh, about this phrase that was, uh, you know, that made it unique, right? Is that this last digit, this zero, right? And so this one, the, the stuff beforehand should be found somewhere up here, right? Or somewhere else in the dictionary. So uh, we take this one, where does that occur? That occurs at zero, 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 one. So we write that down, zero, 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 one. Then we write down that uh, part of it that made it unique, that next digit, zero. We write that down. That's our code word. So we've done three code words so far. Then we look at this one. What is this? Well, again, that uh, uh, one here is found there. So zero, 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 one. And then the part that makes it unique is that one. Here we've got a zero, one. Where do we find that zero is zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero. And then we tackle on that one. Here we've got a zero, zero. So we go zero, zero, one, zero, and add a zero. Here we've got one, zero, zero, right? So the part that made it unique is that last digit. So we look up that one, zero somewhere. Where is that? Oh, it's right there. One, zero, and memory location, zero, zero, one, one. So zero, zero, one, one, and then that last digit of zero. One, 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 let's look at this one, one. Where do we find that at zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, plus that 
part that may unique, that last digit one. Zero, one, zero, where do we find zero, one? It's right there, zero, one, zero, uh, uh, zero, one, zero, one, and then tack on that zero, so on. One, zero, zero, that's it, right, that location seven, right? So zero, one, 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 plus the zero. So, so on, right? All the way down here, let's jump down here because uh, I'm out of time. Uh, so this one, uh, 101 is found uh, right here. So 1110, 1110 plus the 1. Okay, so... Uh, that in summary, we've got information theory leads to definition of entropy as a measure of information. Under certain conditions, there exists a lossless code that compresses source. Huffman coding produces an optimal variable length code that requires knowledge of probabilities. Lempel ziv is a variable. The fixed length code is universal because we don't need to know these um, probabilities a priori. So uh, make sure that you have turned in your um, uh, equalization uh, MATLAB assignment and get uh, you can get started on the next one here also. Um, and then um, I will be catching up on any late assignments. So uh, keep turning those in and uh, just try to keep all your assignments as on time as possible. Uh, there will be a source encoding assignment, uh, and we'll just do uh, uh, Huffman coding on that one. I have it written up and uh, uh, still need to polish it. So we'll, uh, uh, you know, again, make sure you get the equalization one turned in and then uh, get to work on um, the uh, error control coding one, and then we'll have this other one uh, right after that. All right, uh, we'll look at noise figures and nonlinearity spurs and that type of thing on Friday. See you.